All right, well, thank you so much for uh, giving me the opportunity to come and talk to you. Um, uh, how many of you, just a sh quick show of hands, are running containers today in any form? A wow, big crowd, nice. How many of you are running them in production? Nice. How many of you are already using an orchestrator of any kind? Wow. Uh, do we, let's see, well, I, I have never had a room that full of uh, people who are already running in production, so very interesting. Uh, what are you guys using? Let's do, uh, how about Kubernetes? Anyone? Very small. Uh, Swarm? One. Uh, Mesos? Mesosphere? Okay. Uh, Nomad? One Nomad? Uh, custom handwritten thing that sprays and prays. Anyone? I miss anything. Fleet. Fleet. Woo. Um, so that's great. So uh, uh, I hope I'll try and breeze through some of this. So, you know, I always have a good, pretty good uh, experience just level setting for those who aren't uh, using Kubernetes. And it looks like the majority of you aren't. Um, uh, please do. This is supposed to be somewhat interactive, and I'll do a demo and things like that. Um, so you can feel free to jump in at any time. But uh, what I'd like to do is just talk about uh, Kubernetes, how we got to Kubernetes, what our uh, philosophy behind it is, um, and where we see uh, the Kubernetes going, uh, both uh, with our 1.2 release, which should be out in a matter of days, uh, as well as the future. <coughs> Since you're using my Wi-Fi. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, uh, as Yen said, um, this is, containers are not new to Google. Uh, the concept of containers is obviously quite old. Uh, I think we did a historical look at it, and the first one was introduced in around 1989. Like a pure, you know, within a single OS form of a uh, isolated namespace, isolated um, uh, process, resource process uh, mm -hmm. style container. Um, Google were, uh, some of Google's engineers were the ones who checked in the code into the Linux kernel that enabled it uh, in around 2004. Um, obviously they weren't alone and they were built on the shoulders of giants, but uh, this was something that was incredibly important for Google. Um, what we realized at Google was that uh, machines are always going to be heterogeneous. Um, even OSs that you run on those machines are going to be heterogeneous based on the requirements of those underlying infrastructure. Uh, and what we wanted to do was have application developers not think about what was running underneath them at all. Uh, all we really wanted to do is give the uh, application developers the ability to specify a given dependency for their application and then roll it out and let you know someone else handle the infrastructure side of the world. Um, and, and that's what we made a bet on in 2004. That's when we started doing the work. Uh, Borg, which is our own internal system for orchestrating those containers as we rolled them out, came out uh, just a little bit later. Uh, and as a result, we've been running on, on containers uh, for, for uh, 10 years, more, more than 10 years at this point. And as Jens said earlier, everything at Google runs in a container. Literally everything. Uh, Gmail, web search maps, um, every date bit you store on disk, uh, every network process, um, even Google Cloud Platform that offers VMs, each of those VMs uh, runs inside a container. Um, and again, it's because it gives us the ability to move these things around in such an elegant way and respond very quickly to customer demand changes and so on. Um, everything runs in a container. As a result, we spin up more than two billion a week. So, when you think about adopting containers, and, and it looks like a lot of the folks in this room have already gone down this road, um, the first thing you do is you're going to run into a set of problems, just like you ran into when you first made the migration to VMs, just like you made the migration to first running your own data center. You have to think about deploying and updating. Uh, you have to think about managing those objects once they're out there. You know, too much uh, workloads, not enough workloads, machines go down, machines come up. Uh, you have to think about how to isolate each of those workloads, whether or not it's multi-tenancy on a single device uh, or across your data center. Um, you have to think about discovery. Once you bring something up, how do you notify all the other things in that data center around uh, the thing that you just brought up? 
And then, of course, scaling and replication. Do you want to run n, n plus 1, n plus 2, and so on. So <laughs> it, is, it is a different way to think about uh, how you run your production architecture. It is something that with all the concepts are the same, and they're going to be very familiar to you, but you're going to have to do kind of a translation mapping in your head. What are the new sets of tools that are required for me to run this thing in production? So we, uh, in 2014, introduced Kubernetes. Kubernetes is based on what we run at Google. Uh, we, we, what we run at Google is something called Borg. Uh, we released it in 2000, uh, we built it in starting in about 2005, 2006 to support all those containers that we talked about uh, earlier. And in 2013, we looked at Borg, we looked at the advent of people adopting containers, whether or not it was Docker or Rocket um, or, you know, LXC. Um, what, what were people going to need to do when they brought things to production? And so we kind of reversed the, you know, rewound the tape, started playing and said, well, you know what, they're going to need something pretty close to what we did with Borg. And so we took all the concepts in Borg, migrated them to open source, rewrote it in Go at that point, and released it to the open source. And, and the only reason we didn't release the Borg code, there's nothing special about it, it's just not really useful for folks that don't already have our data center. Um, our data center is extremely bespoke, you know, no one else in the world runs like we do, and it, it wouldn't make a lot of difference for folks. You'd have to build an enormous amount of translation. Uh, but uh, in every other way, if you looked at a Borg configuration and a Kubernetes configuration, it looked very, very, very similar. But the most important part uh, on this slide is this middle one here, which is much in the same way that we with Kubernetes or we with Borg have heterogeneous data centers that are wired together behind this container architecture. Um, we want very much Kubernetes to support all sorts of different deployments out there in the world. So uh, though I have a Google hat on because they pay my bills, we want Kubernetes to run great on AWS and DigitalOcean and Azure and bare metal and Vagrant and you name it. Kubernetes is designed to run everywhere, uh, including your laptop, um, and designed to work with great partners like CoreOS um, who have specifically designed their OS for running in this containerized workload um, style. And, and with all that, because it is so ubiquitous, because it supports uh, OSs, a variety of OSs, a variety of deployments, um, you're able to, you're, as application developers, you're able to focus on applications and not machines. That's an extremely important concept. Uh, rather than thinking about what version a kernel is, or whether or not the right version of libc has been laid down, whether or not IP tables is configured in exactly the way you want, um, you simply describe to the cluster what the requirements of your applications are, and then you're able, and then the cluster takes care of the rest. So the journey when you're in um, uh, adopting containers, and again, because most of you um, have gone down containers uh, already. Um, You've probably gone down this experience, but you start with an inefficient in infrastructure, you adopt containers, uh, and again, that's where something like Rocket will, will suffice really, really well. Well isolated, gives you great security profile. You then adopt Kubernetes to bring that to production, and at the end of the day, you get agile deployments and much faster time to market. So your developer can make a small change check that code in, check that container in with a binary that they know works, and then push that out to Kubernetes, which takes care of running everything else under the hood. Uh, and just, just what I mentioned before, Kubernetes really is designed to run everywhere. If it doesn't run anywhere, that's a bug, and we want to know about it. Um, and this is real world adoption. I understand eBay's in the room somewhere. Uh, already, uh, you guys are a deployment. Uh, with some of the workloads in, in the US. Uh, and this is just a very small subset. I can fill many slides with the logos of folks who are uh, working with Kubernetes today. Uh, and it is something I really want to stress. These, these folks are not just using Kubernetes. They are contributing back to the platform. We have over 650 unique contributors. As part of the 1.2 release, we had over 5,000 commits to the core platform. And that was over a three and a half-ish month time frame. 
Um, and we expect that only to accelerate over time. Uh, we see folks taking Kubernetes, giving us feedback back into the product, or straight pull requests and making the product better. Uh, who's familiar with the concept of pets versus cattle? A lot of folks. Okay. So the idea, again, is um, you really want to think about your container as immutable, that you roll it out, you <coughs> hand it to Kubernetes, and if it's sick, you kill it and move it on to you know, uh, the next one. Um, Kubernetes makes it so you shouldn't care about the underlying infrastructure. So you shouldn't care about any individual container. As long as your application is meeting the uh, performance profile, as a whole, uh, if you spin up 100 containers and three of them are sick, no problem. You have to have 97, and it's operating within your performance profile. So you kill those, you move on, and, and reschedule them. The 10,000 foot view of Kubernetes is pretty straightforward. You're over here, you interact with Kubernetes via an API uh, or the command line interface, which uh, is basically a thin wrapper over top of API, or via a UI of some form. Uh, we shipped a brand new one in 1.2, which is also a thin wrapper over the API. Again, everything is designed to run through the API. Uh, this is not a you know, very uh, uh, tightly coupled interface. You have, it interacts with a Kubernetes master. And unlike uh, you know, a lot of architecture diagrams that you might have seen in the past, this master doesn't, is not a single gate. It's not a single point of failure. It's simply a way of interacting with Kubernetes. Um, and Kubernetes really happens here. Each one of these green boxes is a node. And on that node, you have a few small binaries. You'll have a kubelet, you'll have, which is a, a small binary that interacts with the Kubernetes master. Uh, you'll have something to run a container, for example, systemd if you're using Rocket. Um, and then you'll have some configuration with the IP tables. Uh, and that's basically it. There's really nothing else magic there. Um, but you're basically, what, what it ends up being is you interact with an API, and the API interacts with that container cluster. So far, so good. High level. Any questions? OK. So there, there's basically two parts here to any container cluster story, getting to that green uh, cloud over there. The first is setting up the cluster. This is largely a one-time exercise. Um, there are f quite a few steps, but they're, they're fairly trivial, and it's what you'd have to set up anyway. You choose a cloud, you choose an OS, uh, you boot some provision machines, configure networking, and so on, um, and then join that to the Kubernetes master. Now, uh, we highly recommend, if this is uh, confusing to you, you can use Google Container Engine. Uh, you can also work with a great partner. CoreOS has Tectonic. You can roll out a cluster. They can help you roll out a cluster in whatever cloud you might like. Uh, you can work with a system integrator just like Zebia, who knows how to do this in their sleep. Uh, they'll have it up and running momentarily. Uh, but the net is, you do have to do this once in order to make this, get this interaction going. And once the interaction is present, then the fun point gets. You establish some pods and containers. You establish a replication controller. Uh, you get those uh, exposed to the world via a service endpoint. And uh, it means that, that your devs don't have to think about what's going on in the hood at all. Question. Yes. So, uh, yes. So I, I, I said some terms there. There are about five terms I need to explain as far as Kubernetes is concerned. Uh, you may have already heard analogs for other platforms, whether or not it, they're running on containers or not. Uh, let me walk you through them. Please stop me if any are confusing. And uh, then we'll get to the demo, which is the fun part. Any questions before, other than vocabulary? OK. So like I said, about five. Stick with me. Uh, the first are pods and volumes. So. 95% of the time, when you hear the term pod, you can substitute in your head container. Now, what, you know, if it's that easy to make that substitution, why did we do that? Well, again, based on our years of experience at Google, what we found is that it is very, very common to actually have to schedule two pods or two containers together always. For example, let's say you have a log shipper that collects logs and sends them to some centralized place. Uh, today, you would just install them both on the same VM. However, 
in the microservice oriented world of every container is a minimum amount of processes necessary to get running. Ideally, you would break those into two containers, but you would still want to schedule them to the same place always. And that's why we developed a pod. So a pod are two containers that run in the name same namespace, share the same C group, uh, they can communicate to each other via localhost, they share a local volume, which I'll get to in a second, um, and let you do uh, all sorts of things separate. So another example might be uh, you want to do SSL termination immediately next to a container, or you might run Nginx uh, as an SSL termination and then have an app that doesn't understand SSL at all but can communicate over localhost. Very common pattern. Um, another pattern is as you have here. Let's say you have a website that has a bunch of thumbnails on it, and every 10 minutes you want to go out and pull all those thumbnails down, store them in a local directory so that you can cache them and, and do all sorts of things like that. Um, again, you would probably, best practice, spin that out to its own container, have your regular, work, uh, your regular server in its own um, container. And again, that lets you update that container independently, do unit tests against each of those containers independently, rev them as, as each one needs, and then when you roll it out, you kill the whole pod, but each one has been tested um, and, and unit tested and integration tested on its own. Uh, again, very powerful pattern. That, that Most of those patterns I talked about are called the sidecar pattern. And it's something that we do all the time inside Google and we thought was really appropriate to do externally as well. So I already talked about volumes. These are similar to, but unfortunately not the same as Docker's volumes. Um, the volume here is scoped to the individual pod. Um, and you would use it for some, any sort of state or, or information that you would want to live beyond the life of that pod. Um, and so in this case, um, uh, you might use something like empty directory or temp directory if you wanted to guarantee there was empty space when you started up. You could mount in things via the host path, uh, which I highly recommend you mount as read-only. You don't have to, but it is a, a really a best practice to mount in the host as read-only. You really don't want to understand what's going on on the, the um, host or be dependent on anything that's going on in the host. If you're doing that, unfortunately, you're very vulnerable to um, uh, sacrificing all the benefits you're seeing from containers. Uh, one of my favorite features is uh, Git repository. So you can literally list a Git repository and mount that in read-only when you first um, start that pod, uh, which means you have a great read-only source that could come from the external world. You can obviously mount in GCE persistent disks, AWS persistent disks, other external storage, um, and things like secrets. So if you have a cluster-wide secret, such as a database password or something like that, you can actually mount that in to the container as a read-only object um, so that you don't have to build that into the configuration of your pod. Yeah? Uh, you said the uh, volumes were for um, things that uh, want uh, to persistent beyond the pod uh, pod lifetime, but yes, that shares pod's lifetime. So I would uh, understand that it dies with with a pod. Um, right. It's not persistent. So the specific volume name, for example, would share the pod's lifetime. You would describe the volume that you're mounting in with a one a, a volume name that is only mounted for the persistence of that volume. But if you use something that was external to the system, like a persistent disk, NFS, or I, uh, iSCSI, then that mount, which disappeared at the time the pod disappeared, would remount in the data that was stored externally. Does that make sense? When, when we say share the pod's lifetime, it's literally the mount that exists in the pod. The one you when you type MNTFS in Linux, it, it creates a mount mm -hmm. at that point. And that's what would go away. And you then, would, the, then the data appears? But the data would be external to that. Mm -hmm. it, it's literally that file handle that disappears, not the um, underlying data, obviously. Now you uh, uh, make the, the coupling alive. Right, exactly. Yeah. Where do you store then the data? So the data you would store it in, in something external to that. In this case, you, you might use a persistent disk if that <coughs> makes sense for your application. Very common to use iSCSI or NFS. Uh, Google does everything with containers. Yes. Oh, where do we store it? Yes. Ah. So Google uses uh, what we call Colossus. 
which is a distributed block store. So what happens is, is um, we spread out all the bits across all the machines that we have, and then we create a inter an interface to those di that distributed block store um, that gets mounted in at the point of container, at the container startup. Um, now, the, the data is actually stored in a container, but the uh, system is designed to be resilient to failure. So we store it, uh, I, I don't even know exactly, I think it's like n plus one, it's probably n plus two to be honest, meaning for every bit that gets written to the disk, it's written two other times. And in that case, so if a single container goes away, the bits are still there somewhere. Um, and then, so at the point of that container dying, the bit gets recreated somewhere else, and in the period while one container is down, uh, it, it's n plus one, and then you would add up the other container and then recreate that bit somewhere else. In the system which runs that distributed uh, process, is that a container of itself or is it a special? Yeah, absolutely. Everything's a container. So in that case, you have an interface layer to the distributed block store, and that interface layer is a set of containers. It's containers all the way down, man. Yeah. Um, do you have an idea of what the practical size limitation is of that system? Uh, Google's block store? Yeah. Oh, I, <laughs> <laughs> I have well, no idea. Not you want, nothing like you want to Like the nut. So I, I've been at Google for about a year, and there are literally sizes of things that I've never seen. Like, you know how there's like a Yottabyte, a Zettabyte? Like, that's old news. Like, there are, I mean, there's an amount of disk available that I have no idea. And I'd be stunned if, like, somebody doesn't have a, I don't know, zettabyte of logs hanging out somewhere. But I, I don't know, to be honest. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, do you know of any uh, commercial or uh, open source available similar product? You know, I was just thinking that. Uh, I actually should look into it. I think, I think the Flocker folks are doing something pretty similar to that. Um, where it is distributed block store, uh, but I'll check it out. Um, we inside Google in the Google Cloud, in the Google Cloud, we have a bunch of storage offerings um, that that mimic that. But in the spirit of hey, I'm half Google and half Kubernetes, um, uh, I'd be surprised if there wasn't something that was doing this externally. And I'll, I'll check it out. And I don't know. How, do you know one? No idea. I'm sure somebody's out there doing it. Like, it's funny. Again, I've been at Google a year. The number, I, I, I'm an open source guy, and uh, I came to Google, and I was like, holy crap, everything, all right, it wasn't invented here, certainly, but everything that you've seen recently, every NoSQL, every distributed X, every MapReduce product in the world, uh, there's a Google internal equivalent, and almost always it was started at Google, and a bunch of people quit Google <laughs> and went outside and like cloned it. Uh, it's fascinating. And I mean, even Borg, right? The number of people who worked on the Borg project and then left and started a scheduler of some sort, <laughs> it's, uh, significant. So we, uh, yeah, uh, it was, it's very funny. Internally, we joke uh, uh, because we went and introduced, you know, we went and recently um, created a uh, Hadoop compatibility layer, which is really funny because Hadoop is almost a word for word recreation of MapReduce, which we had done internally. Mm -hmm. And so the thought that we have to build a MapReduce compatibility layer for the external one that we had created first because we didn't release it. You know, we're, we're trying not to make that mistake again. And so, like, you look at TensorFlow, right? TensorFlow is uh, the um, machine learning architecture that we built, um, uh, that released externally. Uh, it's because we didn't want to, like, have to be coming back here in five years and building a, whatever, you know, compatibility layer for the external one that someone copied off of the one that we have internally. Anyhow, I, look, what, to be clear. Google is not saying that we invented these things or anything like that, right? All these concepts are out there. We happen to have an implementation internally that we like a lot. Um, it's just very funny that, that for the longest time we had this mentality of like, well, we're going to keep it and, you know, we don't want to deal with having an open source project. They are hard to manage and things like that. Um, but we just 
came around and were like, this is crazy. Like, we should at least just give this stuff away so that people can use it. Okay. So, replication controller. Now you got pods. Everyone got pods? Any questions about pods? Good. So, replication controller. Uh, this slide is out of date as of last week. Uh, the new name is replica set. Same exact thing. Think of this not as any kind of fun any kind of function or or anything special about the system. It is simply a way of describing your object in the system that says, "System, I want to make sure no matter what you have a certain amount of these available." And so, in this case, you say, "I have a pod." that I want to run on the system. There must be four at any given time. With those four, you don't care. You don't care where it runs, you don't care when, you don't care what machines, network, etc. You just make sure there are four. And the system takes care of that for you. It watches the pods that are out there, makes sure they're healthy, according to health checks. Uh, if they're healthy, great, good times. If they're not healthy, kill, restart, so on and so forth. Very, very straightforward. You just tell the system. And in this case, for example, the system starts up. You say four. There are three out there. Great. Start one more. Checks again. There are four. Great. I'm good. Make sense? OK. So now we have replica set and pod. <coughs> Let's talk about the next fundamental concept, labels. So a label is an arbitrary key value pair. That means anything you want, A colon B, key value. Um, you use it to represent the identity of your underlying objects and it gives you the ability to interact with them via selectors. So think select all A's in the system where it equals B. Right? Very straightforward. Uh, it, is, it is the way that a replication <coughs> controller looks for pods or a service, which I'll get to in a second, looks for pods and directs traffic or ensures that's a certain amount of running. So, quick example, here's a pod. It's got three labels associated with it. Again, these are arbitrary, app, my app, phase, production, role, FE. You know, same over there, except that's a backend, right? Again, totally arbitrary, you can do it whatever you want. But what it lets you do is select an entire set. So you can say, I want you to shut down everything where app equals my app. Or let's say you want to do a rolling update. I want to do a rolling update where combination app equals my app, role equals front end. Or back end, or prod, or test. And again, because these are labels and you can combine them together, it means you don't have to do the super annoying thing, which we've all done, where you rename your VM to US West one front end prod 25, uh, you know, uh, test cluster version 741, right? Like, that's the name of your VM, because that's the only way you could identify it, right? No, you get labels, they're super convenient, you can do exactly what you want. Okay, so, two more concepts to go. This is not, not, nothing new, but this is our philosophy. So, Docker networking. How does, do how does Docker networking work? Well, you have a node. Node has <coughs> Ethernet on it, some sort. Docker creates I containers on it based independent of whatever the IP address of the node is. These are, you know, one, one, two, right? But you have a new node over here. You have a different IP address, uh, same IP address, new node over here. Three with the same IP address. What do you do? If this one needs to talk to this one, you have to go down to the node. The node has to know about that this container is running over on this node, and then mount it up to the node on the, the uh, node, or excuse me, mount it up to the container on the node itself. Complicated, and ultimately requires a whole bunch of natting in between all those various things. So if you want this container to talk to that container, you have to go through two nats. Which, as we saw at Google, is very painful. Uh, things get out of date extremely quickly. You run into situations where you thought you were on the right port, but you're not. Uh, if you bring up a new container, you have to broker against all the pod, 
the ports that are on there already. Uh, it's a mess. So, no. The answer is what we call IP per pod, which means across the system as a whole, every pod gets a unique IP address and every pod can be routed to every other pod. Now you shouldn't have to think about any of that routing. It's all taken care of for you, the IP tables and the work that the cube proxy does, and I'll show you how that works in just a second. Um, but it means that you can focus on the networking for your pod and your pod only. You don't have to think about anything else. So in that case, here's some pods, here's a pod, here's a pod. Every pod gets its own IP address, and there are IP addresses underneath that are issued by the, the nodes and the, whatever you might use for those networking, but you don't need to think about this. Now, it does mean that you have to create a flat network for all your nodes. As long as every node can see every other node, you're good. If every node can't because you have a micro-segmented network or something along those lines, um, then you're going to need to figure out how to do an overlay. And there are lots of solutions out there. Uh, we highly recommend Flannel, uh, among other things, uh, Flannel from CoreOS, which is great. Uh, but there are lots of solutions for this problem. Make sense? Okay, last bit. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, how far uh, along is support for IPv6? And if too far uh, out, what's the recommended way to get IPv6 traffic? Very good question. IPv6, sorry? I like the question. Okay. Um, I am not 100% sure. I, I have to be honest, I'm not 100% sure. To be clear, we generally have a um, uh, 30,000 pods per single cluster limit as it is today, which should easily be accommodated by the 10 dot IP address space that you have. That said, that's not enough. We would really like it for every pod to be directly routable via IPv6. I don't know exactly when it's coming on. I don't believe it's available yet, but it shouldn't be hard. That said, um, if you already have IPv6 for your, um, for your underlying network, you'll still be able to route between those, right? So the way it works today, you know, your container gets an IP address, IPv4. It goes down to the, the proxy, the IPv tables on the local machine. That will be able to see a different node via IPv6 and then just be routed locally internally. But it, that, that IP tables and cube proxy and IP tables does the, I'll show you what cube proxy is in a second, does the encapsulation and then you can route using whatever makes sense to you. But it's a good point. Uh, I, I, I know we've thought about it a lot, it's just when it lands. It may already be, no, I don't think so. Like the project is moving so fast, it's hard for even me to thank you. Okay, so final thing, services. Um, the way to think about it is, we've already talked about labels, we've talked about pods. A service is a virtual IP address that using a label and its selector, you're able to route between, right? It just becomes a cloud of pods. So, uh, using QProxy, and I'll show you in just a second, it manages interaction between those pods and routes things uh, directly. Um, and this last point is really important. It, it hides the complexity of dealing with the fact that you're running in a container on these very specialized machines. So, let's walk through a quick demo. So the first thing I'm going to do is have a node come up and a uh, app here, Cube Proxy, says to the API server, or excuse me, it, it watches an endpoint on the API server. Uh, and at that watch point, I'm looking for any new services or any new endpoints. Think the, you know, the pod that I'm ultimately going to run it to. You come along and say, I want to do kube control run, and you hand Kubernetes a pod. Kubernetes, the scheduler, goes down to all the nodes and schedules the pods. Once, that, once they're up and healthy, you say kube control expose. So open port 80 and direct it at this, you know, select star, you know, select app where my app, right? 
that watch endpoint says, oh, there's a new service. QProxy, which was watching it, now gets updated with the new service. QProxy goes down and configures the local IP tables and creates that virtual endpoint right there. It then was also watching that, remember, both services and endpoints, and says, okay, there's new endpoints out there. QProxy configures IP tables, and IP tables routes randomly between those, all those pods, which means you have an external client. It comes in. It looks at the VI, uh, virtual endpoint, and it gets randomly routed to a pod. Make sense? Now, again, you didn't have to think about this. You didn't have to think about this. You didn't have to think about the IP addresses of the nodes. If you did do any of that, then uh, the problem with that, if you're thinking about this, the problem is, is that as you brought up new pods, those pods would be out of date. You wouldn't be able to find them, and you'd have to run your own service discovery mechanism. Okay? So far, so good? Yeah, how do you uh, find, uh, because it's a VIP, a real IP address? It is. It is. Yeah, uh, let me show you in a demo. All right, so without further ado, any, any questions before I start the uh, fun part? All right. Ooh, that is very small. Huge. <laughs> okay. Let's get this of a reasonable size. Can everyone read that? Can anyone read that? Yeah, in the back. Yeah. All right. So what I've done here is I've created a very simple client. Call it icons as a service. Hit a button, get an icon. Oops. There we go. Button, 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 icon. Right? Awesome. Super fun. All right. So, and what I can do here is just to show you, and I'll show you why I'm showing you this in a second. There's a it gives you an. Uh, JSON endpoint here that uh, just shows you the information that's being rendered on the front end. So let's see if I let's see if uh, the load balancer is sticky. Uh, you see this endpoint here? Let me see if I hit refresh. That didn't update. All right. What's going on behind the scenes is I'm actually already running this on Kubernetes. This is a single container inside a single pod running on Kubernetes. And what it's doing is this. It's a, this is a replication controller manifest that I described earlier. It's really straightforward, right? You say, I want a replication controller, skip the metadata name, not important. I want two replicas. Here's that selector I talked about earlier, a name and a version, template, metadata, labels. Uh, this is the labels for the, the containers in the pod, or excuse me, the pod itself. And then a specification for the pod, which is simple. It's got an image name, it's got a name for the container, and it's got a liveness probe. That's it. Really straightforward. This is all you need in order to start running a container, as those who were at the event on uh, Saturday did themselves. So there you go. Now, we talked about so uh, service before. What you see here is this is what a service looks like. It's even simpler, right? All it is is some names, for, or excuse me, some labels, the port, the container is surfaced on port 3000, but the external endpoint is port 80, and then I have a selector for that selector name you saw earlier. And that's it. It's looking for anything that has that selector name. Okay? Actually, I'm just remembering that I'm going to have a bug later in the thing because I changed this to make, prove a point earlier, and so I'm going to have to change it on the fly. And let's do the Okay. So back to the demo. So if I go and I get all the pods running on the system right now, you can see here, there I have two pods as I specified earlier. They're ready, they're running. And then I have a dashboard here, which I'm using just to demonstrate the fact that there are two pods running. You can see that here. So here's my uh, endpoint. 
And every half second, I have it pinging that service endpoint with a request saying, give me a new icon. And it updates it with a little demo, a uh, little eye candy. OK, that's not very interesting. Let's scale it. So let's say it's the middle of the day, and I want to get more of them out there. Uh, the, the, again, these are very thin layer over the top of the command line. So cube control, that's the way you interact via the command line. I want you to scale that replication controller, client purple that you just saw listed there, replicas, and uh, I don't know, 24. OK? So I was at 2. I told Kubernetes, OK, you're out of, you don't have enough. I need more. And Kubernetes right now, behind the scenes, is going out to the individual nodes, starting to grab them and scale it up based on the spec I just laid out. So off it goes, up to 24. You can see there it's going. OK? So again, what this shows is just how resilient and reliable you can make things. Um, and let's say, for the sake of argument, I decide to kill this pod for no reason. Oh, let's, uh, let's go down so that you can see it, because it's so big. Uh, I'll go down to 6. So here we are, the replication controller said, uh, I'm now at a spec again. It killed all but six. I'll just refresh this so you can see them all on one screen. And now let's say I did something bad and decide to kill this pod. Control, stop, pod, blah. So that pod will die. You can see there. And then Kubernetes says, wait, you're out of, I'm out of pods. I'm out of spec, I need to start a new one, and it's going to do that. There it is, right? <laughs> what? It was hiding. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so six. What's the difference between the stop and the delete command? Uh, nothing. Okay. Okay. Uh, did I have a delete? I didn't do a delete yet. Delete, I normally use, I, I actually always use stop. I never actually use delete, ever. But that's interesting. Okay, so far so good. So again, behind the scenes, this is just using Docker and running under the hood. So uh, exec ti, I'm going to actually go and look directly into the pod itself from my command line. And you can see here I'm running inside this pod, right? So I can do uh, ps host, host here. Name. What's that? Host name. Uh, what, what host name? Yeah, see the host name. The machine. Uh, sure. You want to see the hostname? <laughs> this is not the hostname. This is inside the pod. Yeah, but then you see the hostname of the. Oh, okay, it's in the. It's in the. Uh, no. Sorry. This, this is the. This is the name of the pod. Sorry. It's more meaningful than a random hostname. That's so. That's that's nice in a way. Is yeah. What you're trying to say? No, no, it's okay. Oh. This is the hostname. So I can also see the hostname of of the pod if you want. What I can do is I can do describe that the this pod. Uh, I use I use two-letter abbreviations. Everything has a two-letter abbreviation. This is pod, the abbreviation, because <laughs> uh, uh, I'm lazy. But if you want to see the host name, here you go. Right? It's it is running on this node right here. And so this is a feature of G Cloud. I can do G Cloud compute SSH uh, directly to that. So now I'm on this. Oh, shit. Which one was I in? Nine? I always get this wrong. Yeah, there you are. G Cloud's got this cool little feature. It means I don't have to like go and grab a bunch of certs and like copy them down. It does that automatically for me. Uh, SU, and I can do Docker. PS. Oh, shit. I forgot my uh, stupid key has actually stopped working. Uh. Where did I find you? Which one was I in? Oh, there it is. So this is literally the Docker that's running. That container got started. OK? And so again, just to prove it to you, so if I kill this container right here, because I'm a malicious person, Docker stop blah, it'll kill that. And then Kubernetes will either try and restart that one because it's OK, or it goes off and starts a new one. So let's see what happens. Maybe all this happened. 
Oh, no, it'll be oh. that one, or it should be in line. So let's see what happens. Oop, that's not good. There, decide to start or restart it. So it's been, again, OK? All right, well, that's not so hard. Let's see what else we can do. Oh, I'm out of date. Oh, well, do that later. OK, so now let's do a rolling update. So one of the things, who likes, um, oh, let's not do that right now. Oh, yeah, let's do that. I changed my mind. Um, so who likes DevOps? Who likes blue green or uh, rolling updates? They're awesome, right? So the, one of the problems is how do you let your system know about the new stuff that's out there without ruining your uh, interaction? Kubernetes has as a first class object the concept of a rolling update, which means it will, one at a time, uh, add a new container, make sure it's healthy, and if it is, bring down an old container as you're doing a rolling update. And again, because it's all behind a common service endpoint, good times. So let's do that right now. You, uh, to show you, I have this, uh, this is what the uh, spec looks like for the new one. Uh, so here was the purple, and here was the uh, bl blue. The only difference between these two is I changed the version number, and I changed the in image name. That's it. Between these two. Okay. So, let's do a rolling update. Okay, off Kubernetes goes. It says here it's going to, according to the spec that it's late, it has internally by default, and you can set this, configure it. Always keep six available, don't exceed seven, and let's scale up. So up one comes, then it's going to pick one at random, and it may be the one over here to the side, we'll see. Oh, pick that one. Scale down. Up, down, up, down. Always with the client responding, no changes. So unfortunately, this takes about 20 seconds because it tries to be very reliable. Uh, there's actually a setting to turn that off. I actually should do that. Uh, like what, uh, turn off uh, health checking. So it just like, it, it like starts one, and then a second, it has been scheduled, but not healthy yet, it just moves on. Which you can do. And we don't do it at Google, but yeah. <laughs> we should do that gracefully. Uh, saying I'm a running transaction over the network to one of these ports. Yeah, so drain is a really important thing. Where you uh, and and what you can do around that is um, there is there are lifecycle hooks as part of each pod. So um, you can say before you stop, execute this command, and during that command you can ch you know basically drain, uh, make sure that it stops receiving new connections, uh, unload anything it wants, and move on. But does that mean the draining process should be implemented in the Docker thing itself? And the TCP tricks they do uh, with some of these technologies is to really take care for that, uh, of that for you? Or does your container and application have to implement that? No, your container does have to implement that because it can't know exactly what your application is doing. Uh, that said, um, uh, the Kubernetes scheduler, uh, I think there's some work either in now or coming soon to have Kubernetes the kube proxy stop routing new connections to that thing, meaning your container won't have to turn off inbound connections, but it will have to handle the connections that it currently has. Um, sure. And again, that's just because we can't know what's going on. Actually. All right, off you go. I don't know why that one's not dying. I, I suspect that's a UI yeah, error. Oh, there it is. Okay, so that's a rolling update. Really straightforward, as you saw, I got to go off and talk and seem smart uh, while it was doing all the work. Uh, but there you go. Um, and and how was it able to, how was this dashboard application, which doesn't know anything about these new pods, able to do that? Well, it is because if I go in here, exec, uh, ti, which as you may recognize is just straight from Docker, and I go in here, Kubernetes mounts or has an internal DNS server which allows for service discovery based on those labels. And what I mean by that is if I go and I do client curl, HTTP, client service, which you saw was just the name of that service that I was using there, and I hit return, now let's do it with the JSON that you saw earlier, it is round robining between them. Right? So it's a fully qualified domain name that's been 
presented to Kubernetes, uh, any pod in Kubernetes, via an internal DNS server. And again, just to prove there's nothing up my sleeve, clear, oops. <laughs> um, just to prove there's nothing up my sleeve, I will do dig, oops, shoot, search, uh, client dash service. Okay, so it's a fully qualified domain name that's available via DNS, so you don't have to run any special agents inside your pods in order to get that service discovery. Client service, default service, cluster, local. Cool? And that points to the VIP. Right. That, that, yeah. is, that literally is the VIP. Yeah. The VIP then rotates between all these things. <coughs> so if you dig again, you get a different IP or the same one? Uh, well, so the, no, that's the VIP. So it would route uh, dynamically. And to, just to show you, like, if I do cube control get service, this is the VIP. And then this is what's programmed into every IP tables and routing between them. This is the external one you see me connecting to here. Okay, last one, last little demo. So uh, you like DevOps. How about some blue-green deployment? There. So I created a new cluster where the button is green. Oh yeah, I didn't show you. So if I go back here, uh, the button is now the button has now been changed from uh, purple to blue. Okay, last bit here. Um, where are you? Oh yes. So now I've created a new one where the only difference between this. And the green one is the version and the container image. Again, you can see, no difference. And I want to do a blue-green deployment where I shift uh, two eighths, one fourth of the traffic to this new deployment as I'm rolling it out. Uh, but I don't want to make any changes to the service endpoint or where my clients are connecting to. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to roll this out. So I'm going to create a new replication controller, which is just at my um, at pointed at those green ones, but I'm not going to take down the old one. So in this case, I create two more as part of that, and so what's going to happen is these new two containers are going to um, join the service endpoint and get one or two eighths of the traffic, one four. And so as that uh, as the green one starts to behave, I now maybe want to go to 50-50. So I'm going to spin up six replicas, where I have six replicas of blue, only two of green. That's why I got two eights. Uh, now I'm going to go to six, which will give me six, to, six out of 12 going to each version. So I do that scale. Um, and while that's coming up, I'll type the next one, which is uh, now that the green continues to perform well, I'm going to scale down blue. And you know, then I'm done. OK? Any questions? I think you should explain that that is based on labels. It is. Uh, so the reason that I'm able to do that is exactly uh, the labels. So in this case, the labels that this service endpoint is looking for is this selector right here. Remember that I said that it's just a key value pair. Select x, where, y. So in this case, select this service endpoint is going to any pod where it matches name equals client template label. And so in this case, this is the selector, and then here is the label, sorry. Here's the label for this one, and here's the label for this one. Make sense? Okay. Any questions before I just finish up here real quick? You, uh, you mentioned the new UI. Yes. Uh, do you have the ability to show it? Um, sure. Uh, I have a little bit of it. Unfortunately, uh, 1.2 hasn't rolled out completely. Uh, 1.2 is not on GKE only. That's all I'm showing here. I can show you a little bit of it. Uh, I just showed this at KubeCon, so forgive me for paging in an old slide. So, let's 
present from here. So the idea is that what we wanted to do is make it very, very simple. You know containers, you know how to build a container locally and make it very easy to start up a, a new one. In this case, we're just going to make it really easy to deploy an application. So you click a button to deploy an app. In the app, all you need to know are the absolute basics of the container. Now, you can do it in more advanced view, just like you saw as part of the YAML that I had earlier. But in this case, I, I know it's fairly small, but it says app equals app name. And you can do whatever you want there. The container image, which is either uh, a short name for Nginx, or uh, excuse me, for uh, Docker Hub, including the, the uh, label or uh, version. You always use a version. Uh, a number of pods that you want to spin up, and then the endpoint that you want it pointing at. And if you have no endpoint, that's fine too. Uh, and then you can also say expose that externally, and it'll it'll do what I did in that. So four total like answers, and you have a container running. And once you do, it looks like this. Very straightforward. You have your app here. You have information about it. Number pod, number pending, image, age, so on. And you have a whole bunch of metrics behind it. So you can see almost anything that you do in the, the um, UI today, or in the command line today. Okay, so just finishing up here real quick. How are we doing on time? Do I have till three? Am I over time already? Yeah, you're over time. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we. Yeah. I'll go real quick. Do the rest of it. There's not much left. In Kubernetes 1.2, we had five big improvements. Uh, scale, you saw the new GUI. Uh, we have a simplified application model, so uh, what you saw there was even a little bit more ba uh, basic. Uh, we have a very easy way for you to roll out applications via code. Uh, we have some automated cluster management tools, including things like run one and only one container per underlying node, improvements in Kubernetes, improvements with uh, ingress, so you can do L7 routing and things like that. And finally, and this is one of the most important things, a built-in extensibility model. So um, it allows writing your own third-party extensions. This is something that's core to Kubernetes. We want very much for you to take it and customize it on your own. Um, there's no, you know, we are a community-driven project, which means not only do we take core code and things like that, but we also, it's incredibly important for us that you can take it and customize it in whatever way you see fit. Um, and everything you saw here from service endpoints to networking to so on uh, is swappable. You can take out anything you'd like. Question on that. That's great. Yeah. For configuration uh, version management, uh, how is that done uh, programmatically? Um, all right. Well, let me show you. Going back to the KubeCon demos. Uh, this is deployment. This is a configuration map. OK. So configuration map. So today, for example, you, ha you normally um, are you want to manage your configuration separately from your container. Today, a lot of times, you'll take a configuration, build it into a container, bad times. Um, the problem is that um, you know there aren't a lot of options. You can either build it in, you can uh, use an external config store, which has its own problems, uh, or you can run a sidecar container that, as I mentioned, that is a pattern before, uh, that pulls in it, but that, that's just more management headache for you. So the solution is what we call config map. In this case, they're late binding, they're live updated, and atomic. So your container starts. And it pulls down that config map that, and mounts it either as a file or an environment variable. Where does it get it from? Uh, it gets it from Kubernetes, the API server. Okay. So what you do is, and I'll show you right here, you, using kube control or whatever tool you want, kube control create, whenever you see dash f, that just means from a file instead of doing it in the command line. Kube control create, in this case, etsy, uh, etcd um, config. And it, this provides a discovery 
rally point. So it mounts it as an environment variable, this you know, discovery URL and add CD peers. It takes, you, you do that, config map, pushes that into the API server, and then any pod that had subscribed to that configuration mapping now gets updated. And so in this case, it pushes it down to those pods. Uh, it is. Um, console requires a local agent running, and we don't. And that's very important to us. Uh, an agent is just one more thing that can crash. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, so is this an abstraction on uh, the concept of console and etcd? Because I think the, the data is stored in the back uh, of uh, etcd behind the API server. Yeah, so, so you may have heard that, that Kubernetes uses etcd. It does. Um, but don't, it is very much an implementation detail uh, that we manage on our own, making mm -hmm. sure that it's stored and up and kept up to date and things like that. You should never think about it. It's like thinking about libc. Just don't worry about it. Yeah, so I have two questions. Yeah. So first of all, how, how, how do you query this value uh, where, where the key is discovery underscore URL? How does the application queries that uh, value? So the, is, what, what kind of mechanism uh, or API does the application need? The a a application needs nothing. It's already provided. You can either mount it as a file. So let's say I put it at etsy slash etcd config. The YAML file, the application can read the no. YAML file. So, right, what would happen is, is in the direct, in the file itself, in the, excuse me, in the pod itself, there would be a file. That file would be named discovery URL, and its value would be this. So this concept is very uh, similar to the secret management. Exactly the same as the secret management. Okay, excellent. Or, and this is better than the secret management, you can mount it as an environment variable. Mm -hmm. Meaning, you go in and you do dollar discovery underscore URL, and the value will be that. Excellent. So now the question two is, um, uh, for what kind of stuff, if, if you would uh, be able to give a best practice recommendation, uh, is there still a need for uh, HCD, console, or other key value store? Or do you say uh, the key Kubernetes abstracts that for you, and you have an uh, application level mechanism that that you know replaces this concept well i mean there is th those things i think excel at distributed state right so etcd is a perfect example of that it's highly reliable it distributes state across a number of things so you could have an atomic store where you know let's say um a given application reached step seven of a workflow and another pod started up and said, what step should I be on? It could pick that up mm -hmm. from the pod and say, OK, I'm ready to go. That's your best practice there. We do not recommend, but it is certainly possible if you have a highly um, complex architecture and it's already dependent on console and things like that, you could absolutely run console, continue to do it as a service discovery agent. You can absolutely use it for config storage. Uh, it is a good highly available uh, distributed key value storage. That said, this is provided for you and supported as a first class API. But it's so. not strictly consistent, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Yes. So it, you, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Late binding, live updated, and atomic. Excellent. Those are our key things. Yeah. And, yeah. And how do you match this because different environments will have different uh, config maps? So that's an excellent point, and that is one of the key things that we recommend about Kubernetes. Uh, this is how we operate inside Google, just FYI. You should have a separate Kubernetes cluster per defined environment. So you have one for dev, one for test, and one for production. So you cannot use it for Or, two. sorry? Oh, you show the blue green type of deployment. I can imagine that you change the configuration for the, you know, the green ones. Well, uh, m maybe. Okay. It, it depends on what you would want. If you were going to do that and you were going to do a blue green deployment of that sort, then you would um, have the blue or the green replication controller uh, ask for a different uh, configuration mapping as part of build time. You would say, I want this to map to this other type of configuration. Uh, or you can use one Kubernetes cluster and have different namespaces for the different areas, and then your configs are by namespace. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you have those different clusters, uh, dev and production, 
um, how do you deploy to those different uh, clusters? Um, uh, related to that is, is Kubernetes ever going to happen? Wow, you're patient, man. Um, okay, so to deploy to those different clusters, very straightforward. It's a single command line interface to swap between uh, environments. So very easy to push out one way versus another. You can do it via the UI as well. Um, Ubernetes, uh, for those that don't know, is a, a universal API that overlays multiple Kubernetes clusters and establishes a federation relationship between each of those Kubernetes clusters. So if you have a Kubernetes cluster in Asia and one in Europe and one in the US, you'll have a single view over the top of them, which means you can do load balancing across them, you can do application migration between them, uh, but our goal is to make it no more complex than managing a single Kubernetes cluster. Um, we announced it at Kubernetes, uh, KubeCon in November. We already have Kubernetes, uh, what we call Kubernetes Lite, which is where the scheduler is aware of different replication zones, um, and that is shipping in part of 1.2, um, which means you can intelligently describe how you want to schedule across a variety of different clusters, uh, or uh, different pools, and ensure reliability according to your spec specification. But that's still within a single Kubernetes cluster. You have to build basically a load balancer that goes between the variety of them. Kubernetes 1.3, which is coming out in a matter of 16 weeks, will have Kubernetes proper, which is what I described, a single universal API that looks across multiple Kubernetes clusters. Uh, where would you store your config, your objects? Uh, which HCD? Uh, no, you would you, it, you would uh, deploy to all you would deploy that config map to each of the Kubernetes clusters. Um, I actually don't know what our solution is going to be for distributed uh, config mapping. Uh, I would be surprised. The team that's working on it is quite well aware of the problems involved, and uh, I'd be surprised if they didn't have an answer for that. But I don't know what it is. The, okay. to, to be specific, very quickly though, to be specific, the, last minute. <laughs> the right answer is you should store your config in some central like GitHub repository and then universally <laughs> deploy. So should we do one last question or do you have a one last, do you have a wrap up you want to give? Um, no, other than, um, <laughs> yeah, no, our biggest goal here truly is giving you power back, right? We want to make it easy for you to ship product faster, to ship it more reliably, like build great distributed systems, um, and, and give you portability. So whether or not it's you running on premises or your laptop running in the cloud, switching to a different cloud, uh, you know, running on top of something like CoreOS, uh, you know, behind a, a Tectonic like uh, uh, PaaS, these are incredibly powerful concepts, and, and you may not be willing or interested in biting all, off all of those pieces at once, um, but if you're able to bite, move to containers today, that gets you some benefit. You move to GKE, or you move to a cloud, AWS, whatever, wherever you are today, that gets you more benefit. You move to Tectonic, that gets you more benefit, and so on. So like, it, it's a gradual process, but because you have, uh, are containerized and highly portable that gives you all that flexibility. So that's basically it. And the most important thing really is that we are open, we are, we, everything you see here is transparent. Um, you know, unlike a lot of uh, other container folks out there, uh, we, Kubernetes has no business model. We never plan to have a business model. We have a Google one which is hosted and we hope to do that pretty well, uh, but you shouldn't. We expect very, very much for Kubernetes to stay in its lane. So we're never going to go and implement a PaaS. We're never going to, as part of Kubernetes, go and manage your underlying cluster and things like that. We're going to give you the signals to do that yourself. But what it means is, is that it's an open platform that anyone can build on top of, and, and hopefully build great big businesses on top of. And we want to help you do that. That's it. Cool. Thank you.